Hey fellas, I don't know about you, but I've always wanted to go to jail. Tax evasion isn't getting me anywhere, so I thought about murder. Yeah, too messy. So I think I should start with smaller crimes before getting into the big leagues. Game piracy is a staple of the video game market. Why pay $60 for this when you can get it for free and pay $100,000 for this? Game piracy is the unauthorized copying and distribution of video game software, and is a form of copyright infringement, or at least that's what it says on the back of this note the government left for me. It's often cited as one of the biggest problems that game developers face. It's incredibly easy to rip these files and distribute them online through direct download links and torrenting websites. Companies like Nintendo try to put a stop to this, meanwhile they release a port of a Wii game on Switch for $60. A lot of measures have been put in place to prevent piracy, but after almost 50 years and too many anti-piracy practices to count on one hand, piracy still remains as prevalent as ever in the modern video game era. Which is why I'm going to take a look at all of it. The history, the measurements put in place to stop anybody from downloading god anything but right to hell retribution, and as well as that, why it's still a thing to this day. This process has been a thing since games were a thing, i.e. the early 70s. With the rise of the personal computer, many realized they could copy these games onto a floppy disk and share these games by hand, because everybody just needed Pong and Shame in one package. Obviously games during this time were very limited, so it wasn't a massive practice during this era, because people barely even knew what a video game was, and chances are, if they did, they already owned a computer that could run them. It was a practice nonetheless, and if you're willing to consider somebody's uncle handing them a pirated copy of Tank, the first true instance of piracy, then game piracy itself can be traced back to this era. Obviously, however, console games were far more prevalent in this age, and I've never seen anybody even try to pirate a copy of a game for the 2600, because it's pretty much impossible. I mean, with enough trying, it might have been possible, but this was in the same era where people crapped themselves to Galaxian. It was a very different time. Now, by the time the 80s had rolled around, piracy had gone from giving your friends a copy of Pong to Super Plum Man's being widely distributed. With the NES and all of its inferior cousins, piracy had started to become a much larger market. The NES particularly was a target for piracy, mainly because of the system systems very restrictive licensing were making games for the system. And since all of this was happening, a bunch of unlicensed games were pumped out for the systems that were carbon copies of other more legal games. For example, Super Mario Bros. is resold with a label that has Epic Home Depot Man on the front. To an unsuspecting customer who's always wanted a game about Home Depot, they rushed to the counter, and when they get home to play, you gotta be kidding me, it's just Mario. Of course, there were ROM hacks during this era, taking a pre-existing game and changing a few things to market it as a new game, but these were far and few in between, and so most pirated games during this era were nothing more than and lazy reproductions with a new label. Despite technically being legal but also not being legal, video game companies started putting anti-piracy measures into video games. Most companies assigned certain small elements to game packaging, so people could easily tell the difference between Dr. Mario and Dr. Plum Man in case the big label on the front wasn't already enough. This included stuff like the official Nintendo seal or just authority seals in general, but when it came to computer games in this era, there were far stronger anti-piracy practices put into place. One of these was the lens lock, a small plastic lens in a fold-away frame. Before any game started, there would be a two-letter code displayed on the screen, but they made sure you couldn't read it all. No, no, no. For that, you'd need the lens lock. Look at these codes through the thing and BAM! There's the code you needed. Enter it and you could finally play Bionic Granny. Oh, thank God. Overall, piracy had become more prevalent during this era, and apparently still wasn't enough of a big deal for companies to do anything more than make some plastic crap and call it a day. But then the 90s came, where game companies actually began to care! Piracy had finally come full circle. What initially started as sharing floppy disks in the 70s had now become sharing floppy disks in the 90s. Go figure. The floppy disk method had become far more widespread, and while counterfeits were still out in the wild, it was clear that this was the main form of piracy during this time. As such, companies had started to put measures into place, mainly in the form of PSAs. Need proof? Look no further than the Integrity Killer, more commonly referred to as Don't Copy That Floppy. This was a video created by the Software Publishers Association in 1992 to go right alongside the campaign of the same name. The video starred Emmy Hart as this jargon of letters and was filmed at Cardozo High School, with production led by the SPA and any other companies that felt like losing their integrity that morning. So the government. The tape was distributed to schools across the US for educational purposes, and looking at it now, there sure is no better way to tell people to stop pirating video games than by cursing their soul for eternity. There's one behind you! Oh man! Crash and burn! Too bad, Corey. Guess that makes me the winner. Again. Temporary winner. I've been holding back. I've been giving you a break, just so you get the hang of it. But now it's time to teach you a little respect. Right. But it'll have to be next time. It's almost fourth period and I do not want to get caught in here. What's the matter with you? You say you don't want to be late for fourth period, but then proceed to stay there for another nine minutes while your soul is uncleansed. Yet, once it's all over, you say, oh, let's play another quick game. Why not just leave while you could? Did I hit you right? Did I hear you saying that you're gonna make a copy of a game without paying? God exists, guys. right? 
These 90s anti-piracy videos were either A, boring educational videos that if anything made you want to pirate games, B, some funky stuff like this, or C, flashy videos that ended up telling you nothing. Is this an ad or did I mistake the Tylenol label for water again? Nevertheless, companies were finally trying to stop video game piracy, and this would only continue to get bigger on both ends by the time the 2000s had come along. Right alongside the start of the decade was the launch of BitTorrent. Finally, a complete Sonic Unleashed with even more regret! This thing was a communication protocol for folks to share large files such as movies, shows, audio, and of course video games. Finally, I can play Bionic Granny without stupid plastic in the way. With the introduction of BitTorrent came a new era of video game piracy, one that persists to this day. Why? Well, it's failed to die because of its appeal. You hop online, get a game for free, and boom, shame galore. But of course, due to its popularity, game companies have put new measures in place that on a whole lot of this. Most notably, game companies try to hinder piracy by including digital riot management tools, or DRM for the tech-savvy folks. This is usually implemented on digital storefronts, stuff like Steam, the Epic Game Store, all of that. How am I gonna play Garfield Kart now? Steam also attempts to make piracy look far less appealing. Why get a game for free and wait an extra half hour when you can spend an extra $60 for accelerated downloads? It's a no-brainer! Certain games use DRMs that negatively alter the gameplay if it's smart enough to realise you're a moron. Stuff like this happens all the time and usually changes the gameplay to hinder the player. Grand Theft Auto 4 makes it impossible to break in cars, Game Dev Tycoon just feels like being a smartass, The Sims 4 goes pixelated, Batman Arkham Asylum defies gravity. These obviously hinder the game, but they taught pirates a good lesson regardless. Arma 2 said screw it and turned you into a bird. That's right, one of the most infamous forms of any piracy in the game because it's just so... odd. There's nothing really to it, you don't experience much else, you just start hallucinating and then bam, Ave. It's very strange, but an awesome implementation nonetheless. After all, you're the swine that illegally downloaded Arma 2, so birds it is. And that is a basic summary of video game piracy. We've gone through a lot ranging from to to even but it's all led to where we are now, an era where piracy is more abundant than ever and companies couldn't give less of a piss. Sure, some very minor anti-piracy propaganda still exists, and most recently there was a whole debacle with Crash Bandicoot 4 and its DRM, but as it stands, piracy is a large market, but with ultimately no punishment. Why is this? Well, for starters, your company is run by Phil Spencer, but for seconds, they really have no reason to. Even though it's a large market, game companies still make tons of profit from the people who can actually live with themselves, so actually investing in anti-piracy will probably cost them more than if they just let people be with their illegal copies of Anthem. Thank God I'm not a swine. Well, after saying piracy like 30 times, surely I've bumped up my crime score enough to be able to go to jail. According to this professional government document, not quite yet. Maybe it is worth a try.